I'm a singer, a songwriter, and a music producer. I travel around the world with my music, but Singapore is where I call home. It's a small place, but there's so much for me to learn about this tiny island and all it has to offer. Nature is a nurturer and the best teacher, but our relationship works both ways. We humans are also using our innovations to help Mother Nature, like the use of design and technology to better study and protect all the flora and fauna around us. Join me in our last episode as I find out how nature can thrive in a man-made world. Guys, I found Nemo! Inspire the building of a lean, mean flying machine. I think we go big. Whoa. Whoa. We were messing with you the whole time. And be integrated with technology in a smart public park. You don't have to climb all the way up the tree to spot some of these issues. Have you heard of the term biophilic design? It aims to integrate elements of our natural world into our public and private spaces. Basically, we get to experience nature right where we live and play. So instead of nature over here and buildings over there, biophilic design brings them together with the help of technology. Meet Alvin. He's a huge nature lover. And this is his office and playground, Marina at Keppel Bay. But wait a minute, wasn't I talking about biophilic design? I see a lot of boats around here. Are you taking me out to sea to find some marine life? Just look over the edge and see what you see. Ooh, are these all corals? Yeah, those are all corals. There's lots of marine life here, including things like anemones, different kinds of algae, seaweed. So what makes this place a biophilic design? Well, biophilic design is basically any structure, right, designed to bring nature and people closer together, right? So by that virtue, you are already experiencing nature firsthand. You're on a pontoon, you're not getting your feet wet, and you're enjoying the marine life that is just over the edge. The marina is usually only accessible to those berthing their boats here. But once a month, members of the public can join a guided tour. Elvin is the curator of this coral walk activity. Let's get in the water and experience the marine organisms firsthand. So we actually get to go in today? Yes, we get to go in. All right. OK, Daniel, I think this looks like a good spot to jump in. No coral outcrops. The footwear is as such. OK, the flippers are adjustable. How deep should they go in? Oh, you're off. <laughs> oh, all the way? All the way? Let's well, see if this is possible. <laughs> well, hey, I think the flippers don't fit. <laughs> Maybe I can use them on my hands. You need to take off your sunglasses first. Strap this around your head. All right. We'll, we'll take it from there. Have you ever snorkeled before? Then? No. No. Never. Okay, so this is the first time. I never thought I'd be snorkeling in Singapore, let alone next to someone's house. <laughs> Are you all ready? Yeah. Okay, put on your... And remember, breathe through your mouth, not through your nose. Okay, let's go. Okay. So far, we have about 80 plus species of corals. You're going to see lots of uh, hard corals and soft corals, right? Hard corals are basically those things that are very rigid, that look like tree branches. And you also see softer-looking organisms, right? Which are actually soft coral. They look like cauliflower and they move around. Guys, I found Nemo! There's an anemone, anemone, anemone! There's an anemone here! Everything's like little fingers. Blip, 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 blip. Corals may look like plants, but they are actually animals made up of polyps. Corals are essentially uh, an animal with a symbiotic relation with an algae inside their cells that actually photosynthesizes and actually make food for the corals as well. The marina was specially designed to accommodate the natural flow of currents in the area, allowing for both marine and coral life to flourish. Keppel Island 
and the marina is actually connected to the mainland via a Keppel Bay Bridge, which is actually a cable stay bridge. And this is a contrast to a solid causeway, right, which doesn't allow water to flow through. The cable stay bridge is suspended, and this allows uh, water to flow through. As a result, sedimentation doesn't have a chance at setting in. It's like a daily bath that keeps the corals clean and their ability to photosynthesize intact. I've been wasting a lot of energy threading water. I don't need to. I float. That's almost my size. <laughs> That one has been growing here since the formation of the pontoons in 2008. Even the sea walls have a purpose. The granite cladding was added for its texture. Because Keppel Island is actually in close proximity to our southern island reefs, there's actually a lot of uh, larvae floating around in our waters. So the moment you can provide optimum conducive environment, the coral larvae adheres quite well to any uneven surface which is what the granite claddings provide. And together with the constant flow of currents, low sedimentation, the corals just flourish. Nature is all around us, but when you put some thought into it, with a pinch of science and technology, you can really bring nature closer to us and make it a bigger part of our life. It's little crazy rich Asians and a little great barrier reef all in one little red dot. I haven't been diving or snorkeling, but I'm signing up for lessons. Up next, I look at nature with a different eye. I become her student. Sometimes I think that I'm a mushroom because I'm a real fungi. <laughs> Have you taken a walk through a field only to find these tiny seeds stuck to your clothes? They've got little hooks on them. A man experienced something similar and had an epiphany. He went on to invent the Velcro. Nature has a solution for every problem. We just need to know where to look. Anuj from the Biomimicry Singapore Network is going to show me just how to do it. We join his co-facilitator, Grace, and his fellow curious nature lovers on a biomimicry walk. Biomimicry is very simply learning from nature. Nature has been around for billions of years and it has figured out ways to live sustainably on this planet without actually harming it. And so it's this practice of reconnecting with nature, looking at it from a different lens and actually understanding its processes and applying them to uh, human designs. Do you guys know what this is? Mimosa. Did you know by studying mimosa, you can learn about flight? How? Oh. How? Oh. So when we touch the plant, it redistributes water, which um, lets the shape change quite dynamically. So if we can master this art, we can really design wings that can change shape. A biomimicry walk can be done anywhere as long as you bring along a healthy dose of curiosity. Today, we're at the Crunchy Marshes. Anuj tells us that there is a challenge coming right up. After this walk, we have to fly. Okay, more like build something that can fly. So the fly we are looking at is actually the hoverfly. It's like a drone. We are still trying to figure out like maneuverability. So if you can mimic a hoverfly flight or a bumblebee flight, then we are golden. Wow. Hey, this is the pot of uh, African tulip tree. This seed um, is dispersed by wind. It has a very thin membrane of nature's plastic to increase the surface area so they can catch the wind and flutter. 
keep this in mind when you are designing your nature's flying or guiding device. In front of us is the bracket fungus. In Singapore, biomimicry has been largely limited to research labs uh, in the past 10 years or so. But increasingly, we've been bringing this practice uh, to the public. So everyone can get excited and participate. Sometimes I think that I'm a mushroom because I'm a real fungi. <laughs> Curiosity awakened. It's time for our biomimicry challenge. So the task today is to develop a flying or a gliding device using all the materials in front of you. Whoever makes it fly the farthest wins. Oh. Yeah. Sounds easy. But it's got a twist. The machine has to carry a load. To be precise, 40 grams. Oh, oh no. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> I'm paired up with Kian Singh. Keep in mind the wing to body mass ratio. The bigger birds usually have this ratio about 15%. If the body is 40 grams, my wing is only 15% weight. If you were a bat, you could go up to 25-30%. Alright, man. I think we go big. We go, bigger is we better. Go big. Wing shape. This relates to the aspect ratio, which is higher the aspect ratio, the more pointed the wing. This allows them to get very good lift. Too much, too much math. I've done too many calculations today. R cube. We want to give it a very light wing so we can make it as big as possible without adding too much weight. Who do you want to mimic? A bee, butterfly, a bat or an eagle? We wanted an aspect ratio to be high, so we looked at the albatross one. We're going to go for a bat bird. Half bat, half bird. Four main forces that affect a flying object. First of all, it will be the thrust the bird that is flying, it will be the energy that is put in for the thrust. Then opposing that will be a drag. So this will be the forward and the backward forces here. It has weight, so that will be your gravity trying to pull it down. And when it cuts the air, something called lift is generated, and that is going to move it up. Each team gets two chances. Albatros is up first. There you go, Daniel. Fly, bird, bat, fly! <laughs> Do you see it went all the way there? And then and it came hit back. the wall. Wow. It turned around and came back here. So you got to measure from there and back. Oh, I'll give you 30 centimeters. You're a failure. Bad bird. Time for our second try. Albatros, don't fail us this time. Yeah, I have a theory. Yes. We were flying it upside down. Whoa. Whoa. We were messing with you the whole time. Of course the albatross can fly. Wow. Woo. That was a nice fly. And the winner is... Grace. Albatross with 5.7 meters. Yay! Yay! Well done, Useless bad bird. <laughs> Get out of here. And not far behind is Albatross with 3.18 meters. Yay! Yay! Good job, guys. Good job, guys. Anuj showed me that biomimicry asks how and why. When I was trying to make this thing fly, it struck me how the answers can be found if you look to nature. I mean, nature is light years ahead of us. It would be silly not to. How else can nature and technology come together? How about a park where innovations prevail? You are required to wear a mask. there are three national gardens in Singapore. The Singapore Botanic Gardens, Gardens by the Bay, and this one right here, Jurong Lake Gardens, the only one set in the heartlands. Spanning 90 hectares, 
Jurong Lake Gardens has also been called one of N Park's living laboratories. I'm meeting Chong Ren, who drives a lot of the innovations going on here. And hello, we've got company. You are required to wear a mask except when engaging in strenuous exercise. This is our surveillance and concierge robot. Uh, it's still being tested at the moment. The purpose of this robot is actually to be able to detect situations that require an advisory. So for example, when you're not wearing a mask or if you're gathering in really large groups. This is also a concierge robot, so it's able to let park visitors know where the nearest toilets are. The robot's about to go on its rounds. Shall we go with it? Yes. Robot, come along. Let's do some work. Don't drag behind. Come on. Come on. A little bit faster. Catch up. <laughs> Catch up, man. You can do it. Zhong Lake Gardens is N Park's living lab. That's one of our grass cutting robots that helps us save manpower. We are a place, a platform for innovators to test bit some of the solutions that they might have to actually address uh, some of our operational issues to improve productivity or even to contribute towards uh, better sustainability outcomes. One of the ways technology has bloomed here is that it's used to care for trees. So my colleague now is doing a routine tree inspection and all this data will be updated on the tree inventory. Every single tree has a unique tree ID associated to it. Can you imagine if NParks were to do an inventory of all 1.5 million urban trees in Singapore? Mind-blowing, I tell you. Each tree in this park's inventory contains information like when it was last inspected or trimmed and its current state of health. As part of doing tree inspections, we also use various different diagnostic tools. So one example is the resistograph, which measures the resistance of tree wood as a proxy for the stability of the tree. If there might be structural issues or cavities within the tree, then you'll register a dip in the resistance reading of the wood. On this graph, you can see that it's a very even increase in wood resistance in the tree, which is what we expect to see uh, if the tree's wood is sound. We also use drones to perform aerial inspections of trees, especially trees that are really tall, so you don't have to climb all the way up the tree. With its size and 4 million visitors annually, the gardens really need an army to keep it going. This is where technology comes in handy. Actually doing site inspections is quite a difficult chore. One of the systems that helps us the most, but is also very invisible, is what we call the integrated management system. Idea. If any of the 790 lights are faulty, or any of the 60 bins need emptying, the system sends push notifications. All right, BB4, you're good to go. Thank you, Daniel. That's a job well done. Since this is Jurong Lake Gardens, is there any special technology being used to manage the water here? One of the attractions that we have is called Clusia Cove, which is a water play. So this water play is being cleansed by a closed-loop water recycling system, where the water is being cleansed by plants. What you're looking at in front of us is actually the cleansing biotope. It consists of a series of terraced aquatic plant beds through which water flows. And then as the water flows through, the aquatic plants are taking out excess nutrients in the water, such as nitrogen, phosphorus, and particulate matter. There are two species of aquatic plants that we use to remove nutrients from the water. The first one is the swamp fern, and then the next one is the cypress. So once the water flows through the biotope bits, it gets cleansed, the nutrients are taken out, it then goes into the water play. Checks for nitrates, ammonia, phosphates, chlorine and pH levels are done daily. The nitrate levels are low, which is great. It shows that the plants are doing their work. Good job, Swamp Fern and Cypress. <laughs> so instead of fancy machinery and double distilled reverse reverse osmosis, you're actually just using plants to kind of filter the water. 
That's right. So this is one example on how we use the relationship between nature and science to achieve day-to-day -day operations. So essentially, uh, we use nature-based solutions to help us to clean the water. For a garden this size, it would take a small army to maintain all of its plants and facilities. But the way they use technology benefits both us humans and nature. After eight weeks, I hope you enjoyed exploring Singapore's wild with me. This journey has got me thinking. What does it mean to live in a city in nature? Hey, it's a mother and baby Kologo. Come on, the party's not over. Come on. <laughs> Go! <laughs> Perhaps it's about play and finding joy in the littlest of things. I got it. <laughs> or connecting our soul to nature's power to heal. Our beautiful theme today is Nature Heals. I am a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Working on a farm. It's going to happen. I have experienced history and heritage tucked away in secret corners. Oh. Oh. You can see, make in Japan. So this is your mysterious place. Yes. Saya belajar daripada bapa saya. Tengok dia bikin macam mana. Bapa saya pun dia belajar lagi kasut saya juga lah. And learns about the ways we can all benefit from the symbiotic relationship between nature and science. Oh, yeah, very Ooh. aggressive. Mangroves is one of our key tools to help mitigate climate change. Perfect. Have you also had your eyes open and your mind blown? Don't stop there. Keep exploring and maybe next time you can show me your version of our city.